There, there was like no mint on my pillows. Kind of pissed off at that. <laughs> mint. Yeah. They put mint on your pillows. You've never been to a hotel where they put a mint on your pillow. No. <laughs> oh my god. Like what hotels have you been staying at besides Red Roof Inn? Um. That know. that's it. Well, if, if Tropicana doesn't count and Trump, then they don't put mints on your fucking pillows. But they're more like casino hotels. That's the problem. Yeah, well, I don't <laughs> stay in a lot of hotels. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Okay. Nick, how, how, are, you, how are you doing with your hotel staying habits? <laughs> all right, now we can't hear you at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't I don't get a lot of mint on, on uh, my pillows, but... I, I don't stay at hotels too often. See? Okay, all right. Uh, I'm not the only one. He's, he's kind of impartial. He doesn't stay at the hotels. Yeah, I don't really stay at hotels either. Uh, uh, apparently, all the, one, all the good ones I stay at have at least one mint on a pillow. Yeah, basically, I think that's how it is. Yes. So is there any uh, mints in the dressing room for the Housecore Horror Festival that you, uh, that you work on? Oh, yes. Green <laughs> M&Ms and all. <laughs> just like uh what was that uh, david lee roth correct yeah did you know he was actually a genius did you know the story behind that no apparently he would put in like green m&ms only in the middle of his uh rider package just to make sure the promoter actually reads it and at the very next line it says only green m&ms or else i have the right to damage the room so once they sign it over he has the right to literally damage any room he wants that's perfect i know and and we all thought he was an asshole. No, he's a genius. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we really carefully have to go through a lot of the writers just for that that simple clause that you just never know what's thrown into them and what you accept. Yeah, definitely. So, who in the 2015 lineup had like a difficult rider? Was it like King Diamond or? You know, like King Diamond's rider, I, I think was probably on point, even though it was um, a large undertaking. Mm -hmm. But the theatrics that went behind that entire show, I think, fit. I mean, we're talking about King Diamond, so yeah. you know, it's right up there, you know, with with like Cooper and anybody else that's got a, a very large stage production. So you know, when you got trailer upon trailer coming in and, and busing a whole bunch of stage props, you know that you're definitely going to be dealing with a lot of detail. <laughs> Yeah, I'm looking over at the other lineups. Uh, you had the King Diamond, Super Joy, and Exodus on on Friday, the November 13th. You had uh, Suffocation, Agoraphobic, Nosebleed, Corrosion of Conformity, Nails on the Saturday. And Sunday, you had uh, Goblin doing uh, Joy of the Dead. Yeah, yeah. Having having that whole lineup was was a really a big dream come true because we, we spent the first two years obviously developing um, – you know what you probably call like a hat trick, you know, it was just kind of like you hope for the best, you know, and you just throw it out there and see. But uh, we had so many bands that wanted to be a part of the third year that we had a lot more option, which was really cool for us. So when, um, uh, when we had like Ryan Taylor uh, come in as a partner to be able to help run everything for Maryland Death Fest, he had been hooked up with Agroforic. So obviously it was like, hey, can we get them to come play? And they were like more than set to come do it. So seeing them perform was just like, just mind blowing. Yeah, that's awesome. Who'd you have on the uh, first two uh, festival years? Oh my god! Um, it, well, any rendition of a Philism as a as we're calling <laughs> we're gonna do you know super joint and down. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I'm doing some licks of you know the Pantera stuff in between. Um, oh my god, we just have so many you know suffocation and. Uh, uh, just draw a blank. There's just so many dang bands. Uh, Gwar, obviously. Um, yeah, we we did uh, the original lineup with Rocky uh, the first year, mm -hmm. and the the second year um, we we had the unfortunate passing of, of Dave. So yeah. uh, we we talked with them, and and they had um, the the new fill in singer, and and uh, she was really cool. So we said, yeah, let's go ahead and let's let's just do a tribute piece just to make it you know, fit and then have you guys come in and, and play the show. And, and everyone loves gore, no matter, you know, what's going on. There's so much theatric and blood that, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it can be terrible and it's still great. Yeah. They really do have the most ridiculous live show I've seen probably ever. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it's cool because it, it, it's such an interactive performance, and it, it, especially like all the bands that come out and play with our fest. Um, 
it, you get so much interaction. The bands are coming out and actually watching other bands perform, you know, while just sitting out in the crowd. So it's not a lot of real segregation that happens. It's all, you know, very eclectic and very blended. Um, like I, I went out on the floor when watching Portal play with Phil and uh, me and Phil were just in there, you know, jamming along the whole time that Portal's out and, you know, just killing it. Um, and, and the fact that we bring in so many bands from all over the world makes it really fun too, because you're de dealing with people that, you know, speak little to no English and people that, hmm. that speak all sorts of different languages, all different walks of life. So it's real fun just to be able to get everyone thrown into a mix for a weekend and, you know, they just get, you know, slobbering drunk, party hard, play loud music and watch horror films all weekend. So it's always fun. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah. And you're, you're actually taking off this year to work on a horror film. Correct. Is there any uh, details about that yet? Yeah, um, it, I, I had written this script um, actually just before joining House Core our first year, and um, that kind of went on the back burner um, just because the the festival was such a beast and an undertaking that I was doing that you know forty plus hours a week on top of a normal day job. Oh, damn. So, you know, you imagine you're dealing with phone calls for hours on end every day, just trying to get things set up and, you know, dealing with writers and just making sure that, you know, your T's are crossed and I's are dotted. And, um, yeah, so like I, I was in the film industry before joining the, the festival and that's how I got hooked up with Corey Mitchell and, and Philip and, um, just brought my, my film aspect to the, the, uh, whole production. And so, um, after the third year, I was just really kind of missing my baby, I guess, so to say. So I really wanted to, to go out there and, and uh, finish doing my project, kind of clear my headspace again so I can go out and focus on the festival again in the future and, you know, bring some new ideas out once I get everything cleared out. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and unfortunately, I read that uh, Corey did pass away in uh, last year, I believe. I'm sorry, yeah, yes. two years ago. Yeah. But did uh, now is it just you and uh, Phil or did you bring on someone else? Well, the, um, the third year we had, uh, had connected with Ryan Taylor from Maryland death fest mm -hmm. and he had actually reached out, um, to fill in Corey real early on, um, when we started the, the festival and, and, uh, had offered his services. And so, um, that was something that we revisited and, and has said, well, you know, you definitely know your shit and, um, you know, Maryland death fest is, is totally worth bragging about. It's a, it's an amazing startup. Um, I think it's like in its 15th year. Yeah, I think it's, it's been around it's, for a while. Yeah. So it, it definitely, um, you know, is tried and true and, and, uh, Ryan is a real solid guy. He knows what he's doing. Um, you know, doesn't bullshit, which is really cool. And, um, you know, really helped us get on the ball and get, get the bands connected with us because, uh, you know, I was fine taking care of the film aspects, but, um, it was very daunting just for the, the house core records to try to come up with everything on their own. So Ryan was essential to being able to connect, you know, a and B together. So that way we could actually get everything produced in timely and, and, uh, and with a great lineup that just wouldn't suck because you're trying to throw something together. It's like, we, it wanted, you know, we, we figured that it was either going to be, um, you know, all or nothing. So if it was going to be something that just, wasn't going to fit and not work out the way that we wanted it to, we weren't going to rush it and make it happen. Mm -hmm. And, and fortunately enough, it, you know, it worked out well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, this usually happens where as in the Aztec uh, theater in San Antonio, or is that a part uh, one year uh, thing? Uh, that was just kind of like a one-off. Oh. Um, we were in Austin the first two years and in San Antonio, the third year. Um, but the idea developed real early on that we would, uh, continue this, uh, you know, probably in a multi-city kind of an idea, especially that it wasn't, um, really meant to be every single year. It was just the first two years followed and you kind of build some momentum. People kind of get to know who you actually are. Um, but it, it definitely wasn't meant to be like mainstream revenue to where it has to happen every single year on a budget and, and these things have to happen. It's just, you know, hey, if this works out, it works out. It's just kind of like bands getting together. It's like, hey, was your schedule open? Yeah, mine's open. Perfect. And, you know, you throw the whole thing together. So um, with Corey's passing, his hometown was San Antonio. He, he lived just north of it. And um, he he was very influential in, in the heavy metal scene between Austin and San Antonio. So we thought it would be really fitting to be able to be in a city that he really loved as well. And, and it's such a heavy metal community there as well that even like meeting with city council, huge metalheads. 
So it was really nice just walking in there, just like, yeah, what can we do for you? And it's like, oh, really? Cool. Yeah, all this right. was easy. Wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Normally you have to convince people like, hey, we well, want to bring, you know, like 10,000, you know, headbangers here. You know, they were just like, what can we do to help you? So it was really cool. Now, are you big into uh, horror movies? You're a big horror junkie? Yeah, yeah, big. Um, cheesier, the better, and, and like the more B. Like, I, for me, I love B horror film because they have the worst budget and the coolest ideas. Mm, yeah. So I kind of look past how horrible the movie is because typically they got really cool ideas. It's not something recycled most of the time. <laughs> You would definitely like the Clash Bar in yep. Clifton by us. <laughs> if you ever come to New Jersey, there's a place called the Clash Bar where it's half bar, half venue, and on the TVs they have like the worst and cheesiest movies. Like it's basically half softcore porn, the other half like zombies coming out of someone's stomach and like eating eating the person out, like not actually eating them out. Well, that's a before scene, but like <laughs> eating like through the intestines and shit, like really like graphic shit. Yeah, I would love to be able to go places like that. The the more eclectic something is, the better. Um, that's why I like a lot of projects that are, um, you know, Tarantino, Rodriguez kind of stuff. You know, because when you get different people working together, it will create something very different, visually stunning. Um, I think that that was the big appeal with a lot of older films. You have know, like Argento and um, you know, more macabre and, and psychedelic and and a lot of projects that. Um, fit not only cinematically but they also just kind of mess with your head the whole time mm -hmm. so and then obviously i'm you know i got my chainsaw shirt on i'm i'm yeah. a yeah. massive texas chainsaw fan now are you into the any other mainstream movies like um the conjuring you know the conjuring i loved a lot um i i knew the the composer uh, from the project so that was uh, really cool to be able to to know a little bit of the the background in the story, but in itself, like I'm a big ghost fan mm -hmm. and I love haunted houses and I love all those kind of stories. So, um, to, to be able to have a, a whole like production about the Warrens and, and like going in depth of like, you know, poltergeist and, and, uh, you know, you know, psychotic spiritual takeovers and, you know, killing and all that. Like, I just love all that stuff. So you can never really go wrong. Like, like I said, horror, it's, it's just great. Mm -hmm. Did you see the new one? I did. Um, I thought it was shot beautifully, but the, the story was just all over the place for me to mm. too much to enjoy it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not actually big into horror movies. I'm actually like a little scaredy bitch when it comes to that. I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. I'm like the, I'm the opposite kind of, I mean, obviously I'm not into them that much, but, uh, I don't get scared. That's the problem. I watch them and I'm like, okay, that was it. You know, I might jump because you're paying attention to one thing and it, and something jumps out. But other than that, I'm. I don't know. I just don't find them horrifying. That's why. I, well, I don't as get as a to them. horror creator, as you yeah. would be, do you find it like bullshit when like they open up the mirror and then they look in? They're like, oh, nothing's back there, and then they close the mirror and then the, boom, it jumps out right behind you. <laughs> like, do you think that's well, like cheesy or? Yeah, I mean, it's a real fine line between cheesy because realistically, no matter what kind of a a story that you're writing, whether you're writing a book or or especially a film. There is a formula, you know, that you have your high peaks and your jumps and, you know, the, there's those sort of things. And so if you could find those moments that deter away from it where you get like a really cool, hot, you know, um, Hitchcock build, you know, where it's that slow suspense, that slow burn that kind of gets into it, that you don't need those jumps. And when those jumps do happen, it's super intentional, but you don't see uh, rarity in a lot of films anymore that catch you like rear window. And, um, and you get to see those moments of just going like, oh shit, you thought this was like a totally normal thing. And then like, you know, the, the fear is totally legit. Mm -hmm. So the, the mirror effect can be really cool, but just as long as it's not for a gag, you know, if you're actually doing it because it's, you know, uh, uh, you got Henry portrait of a serial killer and, and, uh, you know, you're looking at yourself in the mirror, you know, there's that, those pause, mm -hmm. um, then I think it's appropriate. Otherwise, I, I'm not too big into it. It's like I went to see uh, It Follows. Everyone was talking a shitload about that movie being so cool. And and I had a lot of friends that I would take their recommendations on it. So we went to the theater. My wife and I went. And um, my wife and I like wanted to shoot ourselves in the face like halfway through the film. <laughs> now, is that the movie yeah. where like if you if you like kiss someone, you get like this disease or something? Yeah, it's, it's uh, the fucking haunt. 
So, yeah, you, you <laughs> push somebody, this thing comes after you, and it doesn't stop until it kills you and takes the next person down. And, and it had a, a really chill, interesting idea, but it just got to be where if you just, like, lightly skipped, you would be ahead of whatever this creature thing that was after you. It, it would never catch up to you. Mm. So it, it didn't have that whole Jason Voorhees where like, okay, it's standing there and then the next second it pops up in a whole nother spot. Like it just did like a lightning bolt jog in front of you. Like this one's just, oh, it's coming at me at a very slow pace. Okay, well, I'll just turn around, keep walking. It, it just didn't catch me at all. Mm. So did they make the villain or the horror creature more humanized with that? Or did it just... Like, you know, like if you talk about like JC, if you talk about like Freddy, where he just pops up in like your dreams and stuff like that, like you look at those guys as, as like invincible. And then you have uh, like one Texas Chainsaw, I forgot, I think like the 2003 version, where you slow as shit and everyone is like tripping over themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's a real problem where there's the people that like love slow walking zombies and the people that love the running zombies. Um, they both have their places, but this one, it just needed to be like, it should have been chasing the shit out of you. Mm. And if it was doing so, then the, the pecking order of all the people that need to be killed, it would have been a five minute movie. <laughs> so, so I think they like, they were just like, okay, fill in, you know, the next five minutes with a B roll shot of the woods and nothing else. And, and it just did not capture my attention the way that I was hoping that it would have, you know, it had a lot of opportunity that it just missed the mark of. Mm. Yeah, I think that's the problem with me in horror movies. It's like, all right, he's walking after me. How is that scary? I could just walk a little faster or run, and I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I I understand the trouble as a writer that um, you hit roadblocks and and then you try to shoot something and it doesn't come out the way that you want and, and there's just so many factors of things that you have to just kind of wing it with, mm -hmm. but. If you don't have a solid principal idea to begin with, then you probably should just wait and make sure that it's really on point. You know, like hand your work off to somebody else and, and then send to somebody else again and somebody else again and really, you know, get an idea of like where you're fucking up and where you're on point. And if someone else is confused about it, then everybody else is going to be confused about something. Mm -hmm. So just having that solid idea to begin with um, is probably the, the first foremost thing that, that anybody should look at when they want to do a movie. Um, I, I wouldn't say that anything that I, I do is ever going to be perfect. You know, it's just, it's perfect in my head just because it's my idea, mm. but I, I hand my stuff off to my wife and my wife is, um, you know, politely critical. <laughs> and, it, it sucks, and, Nick. It sucks. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's just like, Hey, um, no, I get this. You know, like uh, one of the things I, I gave her to read one time, she goes, you know, you're seriously fucked up. <laughs> uh, and I knew I was on point, yep. you know, but then I have other points. I, I go back and read it and I'm like, no, not so much. And so when I, I picked my script back up after um, the festival last year and I, and I started doing the rewrites, um, a lot happens in three years, you know, from when you write something and you're like, that was totally stupid. Like I really, <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but at the time it was great. But now that I had time to, you know, have that refresher period to go through and figure out what I want and, but mine, mine's that cool, kind of cool spook house, ghost haunting kind of an idea. Um, I just like old houses. So it doesn't matter if, you know, someone's being chased with a chainsaw through it or if you got a house of a thousand corpses in it or the exorcist. Like, mm -hmm. if it's just an old creepy house and really messed up things are happening in it, like, I'm always going to dig it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, question for you. What do you think is the best horror movie ever? Just throwing it out there shit best ever um or do you have to compare it to like categories like all right the best zombie movie is this the best like villain is this so on and so forth well i'm not i'm not huge into zombie movies um i i can appreciate them but i think I, after so many years you kind of get burnt out on them mm. uh texas chainsaw would be in in probably my top four um and that's like I the original ones yes yeah well and that's that's why like our second year with the festival, uh, we did the the official 40th anniversary reunion of the fest. I knew some of the crew um, from working at conventions and stuff over the years. So um, that for me was a huge honor to, to have them come and, and have the entire cast do a reunion. Um, and so for me, that's always going to be, you know, a prime pick. But, it, but my vision of horror is also different. I like psychological horror a lot. Mm -hmm. So Clockwork Orange 
Oh yeah, uh, good one. You know, being being adapted from a short story into the, you know a full length feature film and and uh, Kubrick's you know beautiful cinematic landscapes with that whole idea of you know is it right to change somebody else's will you know forcibly mm-hmm. that, that's kind of a horrific idea to me um, you know in the, the stuff that happens that that leads to uh, you know the climax of having that change and then him clicking back in the end and yeah. uh, you know that, that's horrific to me. Um, but you got things like Rear Window, uh, Suspiria. There, I mean, there's just so many cool, you know, throwbacks that just have really unique ideas that have very, um, you know, mess up dark things. Um, Madhouse. Madhouse isn't really a very scary movie, but it's a total badass Vincent Price film uh, that makes fun of itself. You know, being you know an old horror actor. And um, there's some brilliant kills that they they do with the whole falling, collapsing bed and killing the director and doing all those sort of things. So, like, there's some brilliant horror and and things that I wish that um, still existed. Yeah. Actually, I took one college class. I forgot what it was. But my professor told me something that, like, stuck with me for the rest of my life. He goes, have you ever watched The Exorcist? The whole class said yes. Uh, Have you ever watched The Exorcist without the sound on? And my class is like looking at him like, what the hell? He goes, it's a comedy. So for our homework assignment, we watched the entire Exorcist with the sound off. And I was basically laughing at it. So I think sound is very underappreciated in horror. Oh, yeah. Scoring is one of my favorite things in the entire planet. I listen to more scoring than I probably listen to anything else. Mm. Um, I'm a huge metalhead. But uh, yeah, The Exorcist is just an amazing piece of scoring work. Um, there, there's actually some audio bits, um, that had been thrown out from the original score that was created. It was like 15 minutes long and it was horrific. <laughs> it was, it, it was, and, and I mean, in the best possible way, like it was super macabre and dark, but it didn't, wasn't as catchy as having that, you know, that little chime that yep. everyone is so used to, but it, it was a beautiful macabre. It was that Suspiria, Argento, you know, flowing, you know, crazy killer ballerina thing, you know, just, I was like, this is so cool, but I can understand why they threw it out because the, the tone of a sound that's created in a film can change the, the cinematic part completely. So, you know, when you find those niches, you're going to stick with it all the way. Yeah. I hear you there. And going back to the, um, the festival where you had the 40th anniversary of Texas chainsaw, was that, um, did, uh, was it Gunnar Hunt Hansen that was uh, Leatherface? Yeah, yeah. Didn't he just pass away not too long ago? Or he did. Uh, he passed away um, just this last year. Okay, so you actually got him right before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had um, we had the the entire living cast. Um, it was only short one one cast member was the the gentleman who was in the wheelchair. Okay. Um and uh, and um, not grandpa but the the dad the crazy barbecue yes, dad. Yeah. Hey, yep. Um, other than that, we had we had the entire living cast, um, and we we had this original cinematographer and, and a whole bunch of other people there that um, got everything going. Uh, we had Tim Harden, uh, who is the the president of their fan club, that uh, helped us connect all of all the uh, the people for where we had the gaps. Um, I I'd been talking to Marilyn Burns um, before she had passed away, actually just before the the festival even happened. And she was monumental in, in actually getting the whole cast on board, and she was a real sweetheart. And so I was really looking forward to being able to to have her there at the reunion. Yeah. Um, and so the, you know, they're just really wonderful people, and being able to get Gunner out there um, before he had passed was a real treat. Super, super nice guy. Um, you know, the gentle giant. You know, he. <laughs> A real short, um, short attention span for talking with people because you can imagine that you've been talking about this film for forty years to yeah, people. Yeah, he's fucking sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's just like, okay, great, awesome, move on. But um, we we really wanted to focus on the reunion being about them and what they wanted to do, and that's really what I think sets us apart from other fests um, and conventions is that we work hand in hand with whatever guests that we select. You know, it's not like we have to have someone, we want someone to come in and we try to base it around the films and the music that we're presenting. So, you know, we'll, we'll say, Hey, we got this band, you know, here's our band roster. You know, you like any of these bands and sometimes like they just go crazy. Cause they're like, Oh my God, like I haven't seen it. And I wanted to go see this. And we're like, you want to go introduce them, you know, like <laughs> just go and do these things. So we just say like, Hey, you know, you want to talk about a movie? Um, 
you, you don't have to talk about it. You can. You could intro a film that's not even yours. You know, if you happen to like something we're showing, like, what do you want to do? So it, it was super engaging for all of them, and they really loved it a lot. Wow. So ex- exactly how did the festival work? Did a band play, and then they showed a film, or just – I'm I'm actually unfamiliar with it. Like I've heard of the name before, and of course I know almost all the bands listed. But like, how yes. did everything like come about? Well, uh, basically, the the first two years when we were in Austin, uh, we we had uh, an entire city block downtown that we had two, uh, excuse me, two major music venues, um, one on either side of of the um, city blocks, and in between. We had uh, a grindhouse tents set up out back so we could show original 35 millimeter real films, bands playing all at the same time. We had uh, inner uh, offices that we had rented out and converted into showrooms. So it was pretty much nonstop music and film all the time. Like you wow. weren't going to be able to have time to see everything, which was our point. It was like you really had to be selective about what you your intention was when you came and it would leave you wanting more, you know, the next time you came back. And so that idea grew the more that we went on. We were just like, okay, right. well, maybe we could fix the schedule so that way maybe people can really see this band because I'm sure that, like, everyone's going to leave, you know, Howard the Duck to go see, you know, Exodus yeah. <laughs> you know, or something. Mm-hmm. So we started figuring out um, a, a better plan as the years went on. Um, but by, by our third year when we were in San Antonio – our um we had two music venues uh one was a, a couple blocks away from our our main headquarters uh but at the aztec theater across the street from our our ho- convention and hotel um just had this this massive venue and the aztec is just a beautiful as you can imagine aztec featured look yes. <laughs> uh, you know very uh, like 1940s kind of interior and um we we just said you know what we're gonna go ahead and and let uh, the, the A bands, you know, the headlining bands play in the late afternoon into the evening. And we would let all the second stage acts and everything play over at, at uh, the Corova, which is the other um, bar stage that we had. And uh, we kind of let um, up and coming bands, local stuff, because we, we were all about supporting local as much as possible. So we, we had a lot of submissions. So we said, you know, like, yeah, like, let's go ahead and do it. We're going to kick it off on Thursday night, which is always our unofficial kickoff party. And we just say, you know, like, here's five bucks at the door. Come on in. We're just going to have everyone just start ripping acts and, and coming in and playing. And um, and those those opening nights are real fun, too, because that's kind of like when everyone gets out and starts kind of just having fun. So some of the bands um, that are there early will come in and jump on stage and just start grabbing instruments and playing stuff. So you never know what you're going to expect. Um, for us, you know, running the production, we just know that it's going to be nonstop. So we want to show films all day and keep a, a real solid set list going through for films that people, you know, the, the, uh, you know, film critics and people who do reviews and all that, they can, you know, spend the early morning coming in and drinking a margarita and watching a movie at, at like seven o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. or they can go and just catch a band playing, you know, starting at like 10 usually. Wow. It's always real fun and it'll go all the way into the wee hours. That's awesome. Yeah, there's nothing like that around here, Dan. No, seriously. Yeah, it, it's weird because like New York was like somewhat of a mecca for, you know, a whole bunch of like entertainment. And apparently it's like moving out west and now down south with, you know, you have like uh, your thing, House Core Horror. You have uh, South by Southwest. You have like a lot of great stuff happening down in Texas and not in New Jersey or New York. No, it just sucks. We get like random hipster festivals like Governor's Ball. That's unfortunately all we get. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's real unfortunate because there's so many bands on the East Coast that I absolutely adore and, and I would die to be able to see perform, even though they, they really don't. Um, you know, like Dry Kill Logic and so like that. I, I would just totally love to be able to see some acts and just be like, you know what? If some year in the future that we ever hit the coast and did that, and like I would be phoning a ton of different people and just going like, "Hey, you probably haven't played shit in like ten years, but you want to come out?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you would. I think that would work well with uh, the this is hardcore fest out in Philly. I honestly, I think if you could team up with them, I think that'd be a perfect venue. Yeah, yeah. There, there are some really great opportunities that that I hope in the future um, can get rolled out and. Um, and for me, like the the idea of maybe being a smaller production, but it would be like a rolling road show, 
Um, I mean, that's kind of how we originally pictured it when it was just kind of a little concept idea. Because originally, um, Corey Mitchell and Philip Insamo uh, came up with this whole idea while they were writing uh, Philip's autobiography. And they just said, you know, hey, it'd be kind of cool if we just set up this whole, you know, like throw some movies in a garage and invite some friends and, and uh, drink some beers and just chill out. And then it just kind of started, you know, adapting into, you know, we know a lot of really big bands. Maybe we can expand that a little bit more. And I was like, oh, we can throw in more films. And, and so really by the time that um, I came into the idea, it was already this this giant snowball that I just grabbed a hold of and let roll right over me and, you know, let, let it uh, be what it is. Um, but the the one thing that we always learned, though, was that uh, never to force anything. You know, it's, it's just if it's not going to happen naturally, just let it go. You know, it's like there's a lot of bands that – you really would hope that their schedule would work out, but it didn't. Um, you know, and that's how, like how King Diamond kind of fell into our laps was that uh, he he had been talking with uh, the Aztec um, prior to us uh, dealing with the venue about coming out and doing a show. So um, it was actually that that venue's promoter that got a hold of of a uh, King and and had talked to them and said like, hey, you know, if we can all connect make this happen let's see and uh king was totally on board like right off the bat so um you know it's just those moments you know things happen you know when they needed to um we we had talked uh to ghost and and ghost obviously is um very close with phil and uh that was one of the big bands that we had hoped that were going to come on but their schedule happened to be like two weeks difference from what we were dealing with so we were just like, oh, it's you know, it's a hit and it's a miss, but you know, there's always something in the future. Mm-hmm. Wasn't Phil in that infamous ghost picture without the uh, makeup on Papa Emeritus? Yeah, yeah, that's what I remember. I think that was the yeah, first time he's... that people were like, okay, we know who this is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, Phil's always been a, a very big supporter of them, like from the get go, even before you know they they really hit it when they did, and um, it was kind of the same thing. Uh, he went to. Um, uh, Australia and got hooked up with portal on, on their little tour down there. And, and, uh, they played host to him and he was just like, you guys are such wonderful hosts. We get to host you. Mm -hmm. And so, um, they were one of the bands that he was just like, you got to get them down here. They're coming, set them up. It's like, all right, cool. So they got down here and just totally kicked ass and, and just really awesome guys. And, and the same thing when you see them out of character, you know, cause they're just all in in close makeup. Um, you know, very, very nice, soft-spoken guys. And um, I, I brought them along to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre dinner um, that we had at the Chainsaw House. Mm. And I had to set that up for a very select amount of people, some of the bands. Um, and so Portal is sitting in, in the bus behind me. And, and they're just looking around, you know, looking at all these crazy headbangers and people just like ready to go tear it up. And, and, uh, and I'm like, you, you guys okay? And they're like, oh yeah, this is just really nice. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, you guys can like can have fun too. You know, they just seemed like they were like, in, you know, scared by it. Yeah. Did did uh, people recognize who they were, or is it just once the uh, costume and the makeup's off, like no one knows? Yeah, no one knows. You know, there there's so many um, bands that we bring in from all over that. Um, you know, unless you, you followed them or looked them up and did a lot of research, there's a lot of stuff that, um, it, you know, not really new to us, but we really hope to make new to somebody else, you know, those fans. And that's what it's really about is that promoting music. So if you haven't heard something for us, if it's worthwhile hearing, like, guess what? You're going to see them perform. Mm. So, um, you know, bringing in bands from Canada and people had no idea who they were. And, and so for them, you know, as bands, it's cool because they're not running around like they typically would being in fear of being mobbed. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like, Oh cool. We could actually enjoy ourselves and, and have a good time and, you know, just do what we want to do. So, um, you know, no one knows what, you know, Gwar looks like half of the time running around, you yeah. know, except for you're always going to see a beer in hand. So, you know, it's just like, okay, if you see 10 guys walking together, it's either just a head man, you know, head banging group or they're a band. <laughs> so you can never really tell, you know, so it's always really nice for everyone just to go out and have fun and no one cares. Yeah. I think Brocky was the only one that people actually knew what he looked like. Everyone else was, it's basically still a mystery now, more or less. Yeah. 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 Brocky was like more than happy either way. He was just like, eh, yeah, this is what I look like in and out. I'm like whatever. Yeah. It basically be- became uh odorous. That, that was basically him. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, um, it, you know, you got other other people that are out here, um, like Bruce Corbin, you know, you got War Beast and, and all those kind of guys that are like, the funnest, coolest people ever. And so you hope that those are the guys that go out and interact really well with the crowds and they do, and they just kill it. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just a, a joy to watch all around. And, and my favorite thing is, is getting to watch bands, watch movies mm. <laughs> yeah, because we're cool with throwing popcorn and yelling at the screen and, and doing those things. We had, um, Jim Van Beber down our first year and we were showing like cannibal Holocaust and um, we we had the director uh, as a uh, is that Argento? Sure, I got so many ding directors, but yes. you know we're doing <laughs> Cannibal Holocaust, and um, Jim Van Beber comes in and he he just starts heckling, you know, doing <laughs> his thing, and I was like, oh my god, dude, shut up! <laughs> um, but everyone just had such a good time, you know, because it was just so free and like no one cares, you know, it's just. It's about having fun. You know, it's for fans by fans. Mm -hmm. So anything goes. Mm -hmm. And you had a lot of bands, I'm guessing, into the horror movies too, right? Oh, a ton. Yeah. Like every band that we talked to, uh, we gave them tentative lists of films that we were going to show. Mm -hmm. And then we would try to secure films that they wanted to see mm -hmm. or introduce or something because you never know what, what a person's background really is ever going to be. You know, it, it could be. Um, you got Slayer and their favorite movie is Bambi. So you have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> I doubt that's the case. <laughs> you never know. They are yeah, kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. So it's always good just to see like what, what uh, somebody's into and in, in a movie they um, might have been inspired by. Because um, there's plenty of bands that write about horror films, you know, the, the you know, their psycho killer. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's true craziness and 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 this is the best part you know you could this could only work with like a metal audience like imagine if you brought in let's say uh a pop act like one direction or five seconds of summer and you just sat down watching like i don't know chick flicks or comedies like they'd be they'd be pestered the entire fucking time yeah you couldn't get away with it at all it's it's definitely a different feel and um you know most people get the wrong impression with metal heads that um you know, they, they think that uh, we're sons of anarchy and all that kind of stuff. But it's like, generally the nicest, most friendly people you can meet and, and generally very well behaved. So, you know, just big teddy bears all around. So when you get all these people together, you know, it's more just a love fest. And that sounds totally wrong. <laughs> no, no, but you're absolutely correct. It, it's more of like a like a huge community. There's there's really no like killings like i mean there could be like a few like stabbings here and there like i've seen some pits before like back in like the like the 90s and 2000s where like they would take out knives and like they start like slam dancing with knives i'm like all right that's a little much <laughs> but you know now it's really tamed down but like the the passion is still there it never left and they actually come out for all of these bands whether they heard of them or not and actually give them you know their full attention yeah, exactly. And and I, I think that everyone's used to that culture, uh, you know, slam dancing and moshing and being rough and rowdy. But, um, you know, over time, I've developed the, you know, the understanding of that, you know, your brother falls down, you pick him up, you know, you you protect the person next to you. Um, you know, like I, I heard this story uh, from Gore um, when they were here at the fest talking about how they, they ended up playing a show that was full of neo-Nazis. Oh, and and literally it became a fight between them and the neo Nazis right there on stage and the floor and the whole you know bang and they were just squirting their blood all over them and <laughs> they're just like hey you know what like we don't care we're playing and if you're not gonna be respectful we're not either you know so exactly. it's it's always a hand in hand. Oh god, I could only imagine what that show was like. <laughs> but that's it sounded that. threatening, but it sounded like you know they obviously held their own. I mean it, they they said that they even went to um, a fight in the parking lot and they you know stood their ground. Well, that that was what like hardcore was back in like the seventies and eighties. Like, like New York people hated DC people who hated you know this group of people, and they would actually come to shows and fight. Like I remember, I think it was like John Stewart. He said something about City Gardens, which was a huge punk venue back in like the seventies and eighties. Like right before he made it on, uh, I think what was he MTV VJ or stuff like that. Like right mm -hmm. before he became John Stewart. He used to work as a bartender there. And he would say that like bands would come over from England and get like spit on and get like tr trash thrown at them. And I think one band, I forgot who it was, but it was an English band who just like rented a, a van and toured the entire US. 
their van actually got flipped over. Their tires got slashed. That's like crazy. really, and this oh, happened man. in Trenton, Dan. Well, of course. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, like it's it's come a long way. I'll I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you see a, a film like Green Room, and and you just go like, oh shit, is that even still possible? <laughs> like, you're just afraid of that ever happening. Mm. Yeah, it's craziness, but. All right, uh, I think we cover basically anything. Um, your new film coming out, does it have a uh, Kickstarter or like a crowdfund type of deal yet, or are you thinking about doing that? Yeah, um, I'm I'm kind of holding out right now for a particular production crew I'd like to work with, mm-hmm. um, but by fall, I, I definitely want to get the, the early pre-production stuff out of the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I have my, uh, my my key crew already hired for the, the jobs, Um I, I have a, a gentleman who um, has a few different bands uh, that, that I absolutely adore uh, from Austin, Texas. Um, and his his work's been featured in, in uh, some recent horror type films. Um, the band is called Espetrostatic. Mm, okay. And uh, he's going to be doing an original score uh, based upon my piece. And, and uh, I'm thrilled to be able to have have him working on the project because for me it's just as important to have the sound as it is to, to actually shooting the film um and i got an amazing cinematographer on board and everything so i didn't really have a lot of those key things and you know it's nothing that happens overnight so it's always you know keep the process, taking that yeah mm-hmm. yeah and like i always say like i'm never gonna force anything so if it doesn't feel right i'm fine with waiting i mean i've waited the last three years you <laughs> know rolling out the fest and what's another three or 30 <laughs> exactly yeah yeah like i just know that um i had to take the time you know just to to kind of unload and get it out and do those things so yeah so by fall i'll be kicking it out and um and and seeing where it goes from there and it'll be really fun once we get it out and, and obviously you know showing it at the fest absolutely awesome man all right uh nick where can uh, people find you all right, um, you could find me basically anywhere that you just look up, um, you know, machine house core, uh, machine ATX, uh, anything on Facebook like that. Yeah. I'm covered in a lot of different articles and stuff like that. So, um, I, I have, um, just machine on Facebook. So I think, you, um, I have some writings under like welcome to the machine, that sort of thing. So just a good nickname for me. Cause I'm just kind of a beast and I just don't stop. Mm, there you go. Nice. <laughs> Nick, thank you so much. You got to come back on when the movie is actually out ready to go, and we'll definitely talk more about that. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Big fan. Uh, No problem, Nick. Thank you.